Hello, everybody, and welcome. Today, we'll be discussing game industry mergers and acquisitions, and in particular, to discuss the strategy and outlook of game industry organizational consolidation with a specific eye on the Embracer Group. And so here with us to talk about the games industry, industry roll-ups and consolidation, and more specifically about the Embracer Group, we have, first of all, one of my favorite people in the industry, Kenshi Arasaki, CEO of A Thinky Ape, one of the best in the industry at sort of long tail and forever franchise types of games from the very early days with games like Kingdoms at War. We also have Ken Go, CEO of Deca Games, who specialize in live operations, having taken over and successfully managed a number of live operated titles, such as the former Greedy titles in particular, like Knights and Dragons and Modern War. We have Randy Pitchford, president and CEO of Gearbox. And I think everyone knows Gearbox games, but most notably, games like Borderlands. And finally, we have Lars Vingefwersch, co-founder and group CEO of Embracer Group. I would say quickly becoming very famous for a lot of the recent industry acquisitions they have been making. Welcome everybody to the podcast. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thanks for being here. So I thought we could start maybe with you, Lars, and just kind of jumping right into the Embracer Group and kind of the strategy that you're kind of rolling out. So can you talk to us first about the Embracer Group in terms of the strategy behind acquiring the game studios that you have so far and kind of moving into the future? Yes, yeah, so, you know, first of all, I'd like to, to comment on, you know, I don't see it as a roll-up strategy, you know, okay. looking at Embracer, I would rather look at Embracer as a, a more of a federation of gaming uh, entrepreneurs and creators and we're doing something together uh, you know i started when i was 16 28 years ago trading nes games and i've been you know through all the verticals of the industry and the shifts in the industry and it's just fantastic to build this group of um, you know, great and, and leading entrepreneurs and creators across the industry. And I think, you know, it's not about acquisitions. You know, for me, we are more merging with uh, fantastic companies and we're building this together. And Embracer are giving them the, the resources in forms of capital, obviously, but also the ecosystem we are building. To, to support and, and to, to leverage in the, the synergies, you know, being, you know, IPs or, or development resources or distribution and, and marketing. Um, and I'm super long-term, you know, I've done this for, again, 28 years and I love doing what we're doing and, you know, adding this fantastic, um, entrepreneurs on board that that's also been around in, in many instances for as long uh, and, and you know I'm looking forward to do this for you know another at least 20 years uh, right so, so uh, I, 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 and I think it's important coming back to that and it's this is not like a financial roller you know for me you know I made my money even before I, I, I made the IPO it's it's now being public. I'm using the public market to boost the businesses, and and we are, for example, we are reinvesting as much of as possible of our cash flow into the future, building even greater and better and more games. Uh, so um, feel free, uh, uh, you know. Gentlemen uh, or colleagues here to to you know to to, to give uh, Joseph uh, your view about Embracer, but I think that is really important and 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 you know financial roll up is, is you know it, that is something completely different. Okay, well Lars, maybe we could kind of dive into that comment a little bit more in terms of if you were to think about your strategy and you would characterize it as more of a federation of companies, but talking about the recent movement towards getting additional scale. So in terms of what you're trying to do relative to 
kind of the acquisitions that are happening at other groups, let's say, you know, Stillfront, EG7, MTG, or even on the studio side, Zynga, Playtika, these co other companies that are acquiring to get to more scale, is there, would you say that the motivation for Embracer Group is different from those companies or do, do you think it's similar? I don't know, you know, I have all the respect for my, for, you know, the whole industry and, and my colleagues and, you know, doing, you know, doing, they're doing their business, you know, I'm doing my business and, and, you know, Obviously, I think one differentiator from others could be that we are just very long term. We, I've been working past five years, meeting you know more than seven hundred investors to find the, the absolute most long term investors. So we're building this together. Uh, that's one example of, I think, a differentiation. Uh, it's for me. It's not about you know what the share price is like. The next quarter you know this is about building a real business uh that are sustainable uh so and i'm sure the others having a, a similar mindset i can't talk for them but sure you know, we are doing our thing it, it's also worth pointing out that um one of the things that drew me to embracer was finding out that um lars is basically the majority shareholder and he's gone on record saying that, you know, he's going to do this for the next 20 to 25 years. Um, and to me, that was so, initially that sounded so absurd that I, I needed to look into that some more. And, uh, you know, that creates, I think, a really interesting sort of structure. Uh, so when Lars is talking about long-term, like, you know, there are actual things that we can point to in the organizational design that um, are, are sort of evidence of that. And so maybe we could actually talk about that a little bit more. So from the studio side, Ken, she, Ken, and Randy, when you look at some of the companies, the, the larger companies out there who have been trying to acquire a number of different studios to try and achieve scale for whatever reason, whether it's financial engineering or whether it's to build a federation, like how do you think, and clearly, I mean, you guys almost have been approached by multiple people in the past. So when you're looking at the market right now in terms of a uh, Zynga versus a uh, MTG still front versus Embracer, what's kind of going on in your mind or how are you viewing these different players in the marketplace today? And maybe starting with you, Kenji. Um, so, so yeah, I think, I, I certainly think the market is really interesting with all the co consolidation that's going on. Um, for me, I, I guess I can mostly just talk about, uh, you know, how I sort of viewed Embracer, um, mostly because that's what I obviously have the most experience with. Uh, and so I think, I think in general, the way that we design our own company, um, and, and I think w when I sort of try to contrast the structure at Embracer with other companies I came across in the space, I've really just become, I think, a really big fan of the decentralized model in general. You know, people talk about the decentralized model, but I think it's, it's maybe worth expounding a bit on why I believe that's such a key advantage, and why that's so important and why it's important to sort of really dig into companies that mention that they are, are part of the decentralized model or they have a decentralized structure, but they don't really. And, uh, and, and, and the reason for that is like, you know, I just believe that, the, you know, the corporate graveyard in general is littered with the corpses of companies who were acquired and tried to realize synergies with the parent company, right? And, you know, oftentimes you have, you know, big companies trying to roll them up. They believe they have a centralized team that's, you know, that knows better than the company. Um, and, you know, they end up killing the culture and then the company ends up dying, right? Or they consider it a, a failed acquisition. Um, and so I, I believe actually that the decentralized model is one of the most sustainable ways to grow an organization long-term. And there are various examples of that, right? Um, you know, for example, Amazon's done that internally with their two pizza teams and their, their internal decentralization. Um, companies outside of the gaming industry, like Berkshire Hathaway, have done it external, right, with acquisitions, and they've done it for multiple decades. And I think, I think in general, it's especially important in the gaming industry to worry about the culture of the company being preserved and why a decentralized model is important. Um, you know, I, I just think that gaming in, is is just a creative process, uh, and it's heavily driven by the people and the culture behind it. So if you destroy the culture. You know, you, you basically destroy whatever was unique in that studio's ability to create games in the first place. Um, 
And so the, the lens through which I look at these companies is I, I just kind of look at how are they structured and what are the sort of incentives that that creates. And again, coming back to Berkshire Hathaway, you know, the quote is, you know, you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcome. Um, and so uh, that's sort of how I look at uh, acquires in general. I, I know it's like a really high low level broad overview. I, I don't know that I've experienced enough or have enough expertise to be able to compare and contrast them in more detail than that. Got it. Ken Go? Yeah, I think just to add to that, you know, I think, you know, all of the companies that you mentioned, you know, they're all good and great in their own ways, you know, and, and having the the privilege to be considered by any of them is always, you know, is this a good thing. But I think the, the differences between them is is they, there's, there's similarities around this decentralization that they have, like Kenji mentioned, but there's also different ways that they're tackling it. And in the end, I think the, the main difference is culture uh, between those those different companies. You know, each of them may have a high level similarities in strategy, but then when you talk with the people and you understand how they're organized and how they are operating, that's what I define as culture. And you'll, as you kind of peel underneath the layers, you know, any any company that's acquired, getting acquired, that, you know, one of the big question marks is always going to be like, what is going to happen to me and my company once we join this group? And, you know, the reason I, why I joined Embracer was because I really got along well with Lars. Uh, I really liked the team. I really felt like there was a very similar uh, history and philosophy to how we got started and what we wanted to do. And I felt like they were going to be the best partner to help me reach my ambitions for my company. You know, and I think all of the entrepreneurs who are joining Embracer are not seeing it as an exit. They're seeing it as a launching pad into something bigger and better that we're going to do together. And I think that's what Lars is mentioning. You know, that's what the Embracer group is. It's not, it's not a single company. It's, it's sort of a, it, it's a, it's something that's going to catapult us into another atmosphere to help us do something more than we could have by ourselves. And if you're going to do that with somebody, you want to find somebody you feel you're comfortable with, that you trust, that you feel has the skills and expertise to help you. And, and that's going to be different for every company. So the companies who are joining Embracer feel like Embracer is that partner that's going to be the one that helps them. And they could choose another company and that might be right for other companies. But for the I think for the people who are super long-term, who think about you know these like decade long strategies who believe in uh, this collaboration with like-minded entrepreneurs. I think that's kind of the people who could kind of veer towards Embracer. Right. Randy, what about from your perspective is being kind of, you know, not and it's kind of different from Kenshi and Ken in the sense that you're kind of coming from more of the, the HD side rather than the mobile side. Regardless of the kinds of games we make, I mean, at the end of the day, we're we're the nut jobs that just want to entertain people. You know, we're we're the dancing monkey. We're we're the we're the sideshow freaks that want to salt, swallow the swords and see who's going to watch us as we breathe fire. And uh, uh, you know, it, if you think about some of the like, you know, if you want to get objective about it, we can get outside our medium a little bit and you know, think about music. Uh, if you think about like the greatest songs of all time, in every case, it wasn't that that artist's first song, but. All of us who have gotten somewhere and had people want to bet on us, they tend to like us for what they already know, you know? So like when, when Gearbox is out there working with established publishing partners or other partners, they just want to see us do what they already know us for. And that's great. And like, I'm going to play the hits, you know, like when the Rolling Stones played the Super Bowl in their 60s, uh, they, they opened with Start Me Up, they closed with Satisfaction, but they also had an, uh, one of the new songs there in the middle off the new album. And, and, and you're going to play the hits, of course, but... But we want to push boundaries and take risks and try things and make entertainment that's never been made before. And uh, to do that, it takes resources. It takes capital. And people like, you know, my company and me and Gearbox, and, and I'm sure, you know, Ken Shee and Ken Go have dealt with this. We've, we've, we've had to explore, if we wanted to, to, to do things, we'd have to either explore within the margins of our own success, which fortunately we've all been very successful. So we've, we've been able to do that and prove ourselves. Uh, but that there's a limit to that. There's a limit to the margins of our own success. And, and Lars is, is a really interesting uh, cat who, who gets that entertainers are gonna entertain. And, and he's figured out how to have access to capital and how to connect investors in publicly traded markets through, through, through his eye uh, to trust 
and invest in the creations of talent like Gearbox and, and like all the great companies of the Embracer Group. And, and when, when we can funnel resources and trust uh, to creators who just want to entertain people, just want to make the greatest stuff, cool things are going to happen and value will emerge. And, and, and we have yet to even see how powerful this is. Like this is, this is also, I think, part of the beginning of Embracer's story as, as all of the member companies come to grips with this relationship and apply it towards, uh, towards the next step. The, the value has not even been realized yet. And yet look, look what Embracer has already done. It's, it's pretty, pretty remarkable. And I'm, I'm really thrilled and excited to be a part of it. And I'm, I'm grateful that Lars ex exists. I can't, it, it never occurred to me that such a group could exist before, uh, before discovering it. Uh, and and, and I, 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 I'm just grateful to be a part of it. Right. And so maybe like talking a little bit more about some of the potential synergies and as is Kenshi, you kind of alluded to, to this a little bit and, and talking about decentralization, right? I think one of the, one of the criticisms about decentralization has been the ability to do something beyond just scaling an existing company in terms of whether it's sharing best practices or things like that. I think Supercell is a good example of a company where, you know, it's like, yeah, they're fully de decentralized, but do they actually share best practices? Are there synergies that, that kind of uh, take place between the various studios? And so maybe Lars, as you are gathering these different studios together, what are you seeing as some of the synergies between them or are you thinking kind of kind of supercell zynga like just you know kind of more decentralized and separate yeah so i think that one of the strength of the embrace group is is our operating model i mean you need to understand the operating model uh to understand about synergies so our our group has when, when the transaction with Gearbox and EasyBrain uh, closes, we will have eight operating units. And within those units, there is obviously a daily synergy between, uh, between studios. For example, looking at our first operating unit, uh, THQ Nordic, they have 20 studios uh, and, and you know as many external studios uh, you know, working together under the umbrella of THQ Nordic with all the producers and distribution and marketing and all that. Uh, so, you know, obviously people sometimes say there is no synergies, but on a daily basis, there is a lot of synergies, obviously. Mm -hmm. People are working together. But between the eight operating units, it's obviously sometimes I'm sure there is daily, you know, uh, synergies as well, but then it, it's more about uh, you know finding opportunities and you know for example one one uh, you know being Saber doing a, a Saber Interactive doing a, a porting project on a, on an established IP for example, or being that um, you know the distribution arm of Coach Media doing a distribution in a territory or or just uh, sharing intelligence and, and sharing, you know, resources. Uh, but I think we are just in the early days of this. I think there's so much that could be done uh, and will be done over the coming, you know, five, 10, 20 years across the group. Uh, and, you know, I don't want to force anything, you know, I want people to find and experience the group. And, 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 and people are, you know, talking to each other and sharing, but I think that's the way to do the true long-term cooperation between people, uh, rather than having someone like dictating what they should do. You can moderate things, you can get people together, you know. Unfortunately, we have a, a pandemic, which makes, the, you know, the physical meetings harder, but, um, but hopefully this pandemic will be over soon. I can't wait to, to get together and, and, and meet people. Kenchi, I, I know you've ha had, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about some synergies and things of that nature. So how are you viewing, or what would you ex hope to see from a combined sort of federation type of group in terms of synergies? Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so the way I think about it, I keep, I keep coming back to uh, a point in my life when I had just started the company and I was talking to someone I really admired. I said, um, 
how do I find a good mentor? And they said, Kenshi, you're thinking about it completely wrong. Um, you, don't, you don't want a mentor. What you want to find is a really amazing group of peers, and then you want to level each other up. Um, and it's a, a sort of co-op friendly, you know, co-optition, you know, cooperation and competition, where you're inspired by what each other is doing and you're pushing each other to be better. And when I look back at my career, it, you know, every the, the most productive periods of my life was when I had those sort of peers. And so um, that's that's sort of what I'm looking forward to, you know, at Embracer Group. You know, we have uh, when we're when we're you know, negotiating our acquisition, we had a really great peer with Ken at DECA Games, as well as our other, um, you know, our other operative groups outside of the free-to-play ecosystem. And uh, I was I was sort of confident that that group would only grow over time. And, you know, in the last few months, there's already, you know, there's already Iugo and EasyBrain as well, uh, really amazing companies. And so I believe that, you know, within the decentralized model, that that sort of Sharing and learning um, is, is is like by far the the most sustainable way to sort of achieve any sort of synergies, and it's it's kind of interesting, right? When you think about it, you go to a conference, you're going to see other gaming CEOs, and you're going to talk about numbers, but they're going to be conference numbers, which means they're not going to be real, right? Um, yeah. And you know, but when you're when you're part of the same company and you're shareholders in the same company, you have the same incentives, right? You're really going to uh, open the kimono, so to speak. You're going to share all the real numbers. You're going to share the. You're going to be vulnerable, right? You're going to share the real learnings, um, and and you have you have a reason to do so, and, and 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 you get to do that in a way that you know allows you to be fiercely independent, right? And and I'll, I'll be the first to say this. Like I am a terrible employee, right? And so this is why this sort of model is 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 great for me. And go. Yeah, you know, I just want to, you know double down on what Lars was saying that I think it's very, I, when I've read stuff about Embracer, I think one of the misconceived things is that there is a single strategy and a single set of synergies. But like Lars said, we are organized into these eight operative groups. So I think it's sometimes confusing from an outsider's perspective when they see these different acquisitions happening and they seem to be very unrelated. But actually, if you look really closely and if, if you understand what each of these operative units uh, strategies are, then they start to make more sense. So, you know, with a thinking ape and a Yugo joining DECA, I think that, I think you can see the synergies that, that will happen within that group. And then with Sabre and all of these, uh, these great, you know, double AA, A and triple A developers adding to their group, you can see how they can leverage the, the skills and the strengths of their already great business. You know, and same thing with THQ Nordic and same thing with Cork Media and Coffee Stain. Each of them have their own unique strategies and their own strengths and weaknesses. And as these other studios and companies are joining them, I think if you look really closely, it's, it's easy to see the synergies. But when you are so external and you zoomed out and you see all these things happening, sometimes it's a little bit confusing. I just want to add that, that, you know, think about Embracer as eight separate individual operating units. It could be eight different companies, but it's actually just under one bigger umbrella. Right. And Randy, when I look at Gearbox, I actually see... You know, first of all, when I first read about the you know the the news, I actually thought it was a really fantastic opportunity because when we look at the current trends in the market right now in terms of like cross platform with games like Genshin Impact and things of that nature, that at least on a theoretical basis, if you can take the great sort of you know gameplay game experiences of HD companies and marry that with the expertise that folks like Kenshi and and Ken Go are bringing from a from a free to play live operating type of model that, you know, that's potentially like peanut butter and chocolate, but I, I don't know, what, what are your thoughts in terms of some of the synergies that you would hope to see in, in the future? And uh, am, am I right about the, the HD plus free to play or, or am I wrong about that? Well, I, I do love Reese's peanut butter cups. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, I'll tell you one thing that I think all of the companies in the Embracer group have in common is uh, there's a hunger. Uh, and, and everybody wants to, to, everybody sees opportunity to maximize and, and nobody's there yet. Like there's, all, there's so much opportunity, so much more opportunity that we can capture. And some of that opportunity is going to come through collaborations with partners, through uh, taking advantage of someone else's uh, strength 
and 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 also each other mitigating each other's weaknesses. So so that's a natural instinct that that all that all of the member companies have before uh, and during this 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 relationship that, that we have with Embracer. Now, as the group expands, and, and even with the power that the group already has, there there is going to be things that we notice, like hey, I, I really think there's some opportunity here, and those guys are already kicking ass at that. Maybe we can connect up and get some advantage out of that. But but if we find those opportunities, and as we discover them and interact on them together, there's just no friction between us anymore. We can do, you know, Kenshi was saying it earlier, we can do um, uh, business to business inside the group with much less friction. And we have this perfect mediator, you know, Lars can can make sure that we can, can, can uh, you know, scrape away the usual fear and, and uh, the, 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 the uh, uh, companies that are sometimes even competitors with each other have when they try to do partnerships together. And now in the Embracer group, we're not, we're not competitors, we're all allies now. So that all that fear and all that protection side of what puts friction on a, on a, on a relationship, that can all, all be washed away and we can focus on the value and the opportunity that we might see with each other. Uh, and because, because we, we approach this, because Lars approaches this with, with a decentralized strategy, uh, everybody at the table knows we're there because we want to be. Not because we were dragged there. So, so if you know, if if Ken Go and I want to do a deal, or Kenshi and I want to do a deal, uh, uh, we're, it's not because we're being forced to it. It's because we see some mutual opportunity there, and because we're all in the same family, we can the friction can just just wash away, and that's beautiful. And I'm I'm, I'm pumped. I cannot wait to take advantage of this of, of this this unique feature of the Embracer Group that, that most other kind of centralized. Uh, video game um, uh, corps do not have by by the function of their design. They just can never have it. Um, yeah, just to just to add up to that point, you know, and and maybe to to kind of come back to an earlier question that you had, Joe. You know, um, when we've talked to potential suitors in the past, you know, a, a large part of it is how do I make sure that you know we continue to be autonomous and we get to preserve our culture and. Um, you know, Randy mentioned there's also like a hunger within the entrepreneurs and the Embracer group. Um, and so the thing that was really interesting to me uh, as part of my, my own due diligence is I, I called, I, I was introduced to a bunch of entrepreneurs in the Embracer group and I actually did some back channeling too. Um, and every single entrepreneur that I talked to uh, was still at Embracer you know, after like after their earnout periods. Um, in contrast, when I called others, you know, at other potential acquirers, when I talked to other founders who had been acquired, after two years, most of them were gone. Um, and so to me, I think that's a kind of a really big striking difference. And, uh, and I think that's an advantage, uh, at least in my opinion, for the Embracer group. Right. And when I look at you guys, it's not like, you know, in terms of the kind of companies, you guys have been around for a, quite a while, right? You guys, so talking to this approach about long-term companies, you guys already are long-term companies, and I guess with a long-term perspective. And so Lars, when you're thinking about like the, the acquisition process, as you start to talk to different studios about potentially acquiring them, can you walk us through what that process looks like for you and potentially how it might be different? And like in terms of when you're thinking about acquisition, if you're looking for companies that are long-term, is there anything different in the way that you do diligence or what you look for in terms of culture or things like that? If you could speak to that, that would be great. Yeah, so for, <clears throat> first of all, I would like to point out that most of our acquisitions are, or mergers, that I would okay. prefer to call them okay. when there is a lot of equity <laughs> okay. included. Yeah are driven by the operating groups such as uh, uh, Watch Media or THQ Nordic or, or Saber Interactive and, and so on. Right. So they, they are obviously constantly uh, looking to find more fantastic uh, developers for most uh, to, join their, to join their umbrella. Uh, so that's a kind of a daily activity. And looking now at the group, we have roughly 60 uh, game development studios within Embracer, but we work with another uh, at least 70 external uh, development studios. And over time, we welcome external development team to become part of the, the family, but we don't need to, you know, 
we don't need to own everything, obviously, and and we are super glad and happy and and uh, to continue working with external development teams. That's part of the the, the business. Um, and sometimes those relationships becomes very long term, you know, for for many years, obviously. So I think that is part of the acquisition process that it's driven by the operating units. Um, and uh, major acquisitions uh, are partly driven by, by myself and my team here at the Tran company. Uh, for example, I've been you know, thrilled to get to know Randy over the past years. Uh, and, and uh, including and, and, and you know obviously uh, most of other acquisitions that we have been acquired or merging with uh, under the parent company. Uh, and um, so I think the overall uh, group of people working with m a including the CEOs of the operating units and and you know, people at the parent company there is a lot of lot a lot of people you know there's up to 50 people working that on a daily basis um, and then we have the process of you know agreeing obviously trying i i personally I, I truly enjoy you know physical meeting people and discussing you know you know the business the future how to construct a deal and then kind of agreeing when agreed, we having a, a you know a process with the same advisors that we've been you know working with over the past years. Uh, obviously, doing all the financial and legal and tax due diligence and SPAs and all that. So, yeah, so it's so it's a it's a quite a, it's a quite a organization uh, to you know to do all this. Right. And is there anything in particular, Lars, that you're looking for, whether it comes to like the metrics or kind of revenue range or, you know, operating margin targets or things of that nature? And uh, yeah, maybe we'll start there. Well, you know, I'm looking for, you know, great people that share the same ambition for the future. You know, right. that's, that's what I'm looking for, uh, you know, Great entrepreneurs uh, or, or creators that want to, you know, continue doing what they're doing. That we could, you know, add more resources into, and it's just becoming greater. You know, so I think that's obviously the most important thing. Uh, then looking at the financials, there is this. Every company has different financials, so. And, and Embracer have so many different kind of business models. So, and we are not, you know, for example, you know, I, I always looking at the absolute numbers rather than the percentage, you know, in the end of the day, you, you can't eat the percentage. You, you can only eat an absolute number. So some businesses has lower margins, but take less business risks. Some has amazing margins, but the business risks are much higher. So you need to balance that out. I think that's one of the thing with Embracer, and that's why we are able to to be, you know, a public listed company that we have a very diverse business and very diverse revenue streams. Uh, okay, and I know you mentioned that with Randy, it, this is a process that you said you got to know him over years. Uh, is that? The, the acquisition process, is this something where you do have to establish that relationship? You have to get to know people over years. And it's not like you're going to Kenchi and being like, hey, hello, here's a price, let's do a deal. <laughs> it's it's more of a longer term thing. Is that is that how you would characterize that? Well, I, I got to know Ren, I think it was one and a half years ago. Uh, obviously I know about Gearbox and Randy since 20 years or many, many years back because it's, they have done one of the most uh, amazing games uh, over decades. So, but for me, it's about you know getting to know people uh, over a longer period of time, uh, and I think it's important for people also to evaluate their 
their options. You know, some some entrepreneurs that would like to you know do their own IPO. Some would like to do you know uh, private equities. You know, so there is. I think there is a process for most. That's my experience. That most entrepreneurs that would like to do something else. That would like to take the next step. They they need to go through a process. Sometimes with advisors. Sometimes on their own. Uh, and and sometimes you know that that process takes a few years and then i'm i'm glad to see uh that that in in a quite a few instances that that they decide that embracer is the best al or the alternative they would like to go with got it uh, and then maybe from the studio side, Kenshi, Ken, or Randy, could you guys speak to, was the process a little bit different with, because I, I know you guys were approached by multiple folks, right? So in terms of the process from Embracer relative to other folks, were, were there, was there a different approach in terms of like the questions being asked or in terms of the relationships or things of that nature? Well, I mean, from my experience since since we've existed i think everyone we've ever partnered with uh, either overtly or, uh, uh, or 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 more more subtly has has made overtures uh to try to see if they could just capture our value and acquire the company uh and you know gearbox has kind of been allergic to that uh we we've got a mission we've got we've got things to do you know right. and 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 the 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 usual uh, the usual kind of approach is less about fueling and empowering and, and, you know, injecting rocket fuel into this machine that we built uh, and more about just, you know, um, sort of bleeding out whatever value we were in the moment of realizing. Right. Uh, and, and so I've always, I've always been allergic to that stuff. Um, in fact, it, 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 it's so, it's so true that like, like let's, let's imagine all these entities are like animals out there. To me, I just pictured them all like the shape of a dog. And everything looks exactly the same. Yeah, there's some that are larger and smaller, but I just see this landscape full of dogs. And when I first started interacting with Lars, uh, I thought he was a dog because they all look like dogs. <laughs> but you know, the light, maybe the lighting wasn't quite right or whatever, but I realized, holy shit, this is a wolf. Uh, and and a, a friend of mine, a magician, uh, helped me uh, with that analogy with his sh the show. He's a guy named Derek Delgadio who talks about the time between dog and wolf which is this time of day when the light is such where it's difficult to discern the difference. And I was totally blind. And it, it took a minute uh, of, of knowing Lars and actually uh, 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 cha being challenged and challenging myself to look at what he was actually doing. Uh, and I, I got so used to just discounting and writing off uh, the whole rest of the industry uh, that it took a minute for, for me to even understand uh, the, 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 the genius of Lars' strategy and how, how perfectly suited it is to what we actually all should be doing here as creatives, as entertainers, uh, and as builders of this weird confluence between technology and art. Uh, and, 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 and he's figured it out. And, and I was, holy crap, this is it. This is the model. And it, it changed everything. And it made it, it made it not merely possible to have a conversation that I never expected to have, but but become increasingly excited about it, knowing that it's the it's the uh, it is it is the missing piece to how how we're going to light this rocket and go and go you know visit the stars. It's rocket fuel. It's it's I no longer am, am bound by gasoline uh, or or you know harnessing lightning or fire. Like we we now have high octane rocket fuel, uh, and Lars created it. Can she or can? Yeah, you know, one thing I'd add to that, you know, I think the difference that I experienced in my interactions was this sort of, um, I got this feeling from Larry, you know, and sometimes, you know, when you're doing business, it's sometimes it's about the numbers, sometimes it's about the feeling. Uh, so for me, it was more about this feeling. And I, I think in the process, everyone's going to look at your numbers, but what I think Lars is, maybe his superpower is, uh, in my experience, is just how he judges people and finding the right people that you know, that fit what he's looking for. And when I, and I didn't realize this until I was on the other side of the table and working with him. But when I just realized it now, when we were doing our, our, our discussions, that what made me really comfortable with him was this feeling like uh, he's a real person. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking with the person who has been in my shoes, uh, who knows what I'm thinking and is able to evaluate people and on that kind of level of yeah, this is a good businessman, a good person, somebody's going to fit the culture. And I got the, I don't know, it's like, 
sometimes you feel like you're doing business with a suit or with a paper. And sometimes you feel like you're doing business with an actual human being. And I think that was one of the biggest differences that I felt like when I was dealing with Embracer was that I was dealing with Lars. I was dealing with an actual human and it wasn't like I was joining another company. I was joining Lars himself and that everything that he was telling me, I could take as the truth. Like I, I didn't have to, I never felt like I was had to second guess anything he was telling me because everything I saw, everything I heard, everything that um, he said uh, was was actually happening. And you know, some of these things you you have to make a leap of faith to just trust that you know the the person you're dealing with is going to hold their their word as their bond. But you know, as you talk with a lot of people in the industry, you you, you kind of get a sense of you know, different types of people out there. And when you talk with ours, you get this very altruistic sense of a very uh, my word is my bond. If I tell it to you, I'm going to hold my you know, I'm going to hold to the to that word. You know, and that's thing that's very rare and something that I really appreciated. Kenji. Yeah, um, not too much to add to what the other guys had said, um, other than, you know, over the years, I think ATA or I think Ape has had a lot of suitors. Um, and in, in the same vein, uh, I mostly discounted them or, or we just, you know, we prefer to go our own way. And in fact, um, even before we ran the process in which we joined Embracer, uh, we were, you know, we believed our best years are ahead of us. We believed, you know, we believe that like we're on the verge of, of great and tremendous growth. And the the default path was to stay independent uh, because, you know, we wanted to be in the control of our destiny. Um, and it wasn't until we came across Embracer and the unique structure that they have. Um, and, 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 you know, in line with what Ken was saying, I think, you know, Lars and, and the rest of the team at Embracer, they really personify the quote uh, that, you know, I like to sort of, think about when I ponder any sort of business relationship, right? And that's, if I wouldn't work with you for a lifetime, I won't work with you for five minutes. And, and I think, you know, Lars and, and co are, are a perfect example of people that I want to work with for a lifetime. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and I, think, I think that was, you know, that the sort of uniqueness about that and the way that Embracer creates really great long-term incentives um, for, for, for the entrepreneurs in the group. I think that's why you're starting to see a lot of really great companies and really great people starting to take note. And they're, they're really starting to say like, wow, like this, this is actually something really interesting. And this is something that I should pay attention to. Right. I, I'm very humble hearing you guys. <laughs> I, I don't know what to say. But, uh, thank so, you. Lars, maybe, maybe I could ask a question about essentially successful operating models. Now, Kenji had mentioned that he did some background checks in terms of some of the acquired groups from by Embracer and noted that unlike maybe other acquirers that there were founders and teams that were still there after a few years. Now, when we look at, and not, not to focus on other you know, industry consolidators in the market, but let's say when we look at a company like Zynga, and we saw that in the early days, a lot of their acquisitions just were not having very much success for whatever reason. And then more recently over the, let's say the past three, four years, we've seen a number of their acquisitions add meaningfully to the value of Zynga's business. And I would say much more success, or at least that's the view of the industry is that they've been a lot more successful in recent years. Now, the cynical view on that is that they just kind of moved up and bought like larger scale companies and things of that nature. But in terms of your perspective, and when you think about how do you make sure that the companies you acquire are going to be successful over that long-term period to, to the point about your strategy, how do you think about that in terms of the successful model for acquisition so that you can have not only the companies add value to the company, but be around for a long time and having these management teams or founders be around after two years? Um, no, I, I think it's uh, important to, to understand the fundamental approach to, to uh, you know, is trust. No, it's, and, and the, you know, letting the, the verticals have the autonomy. Uh, I think that is, the key to success, not, not start messing up other people's business. You know, you should support 
you should support uh, uh, you know your businesses obviously whatever what whatever they need and 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 I think it's very easy to you know start adding a lot of people centrally that are kind of experts and directors. Uh, uh, and that will, I, I, I'm, I'm just a firm believer of that that will st could start messing up the business. And that's why at the Embracer level, we don't have a lot of industry experts. So the industry experts are obviously the entrepreneurs that are building this group and their management teams and letting them work together. I think that is a big differentiator. Um, and you know why should I spend these millions or billions acquiring the best and most amazing companies and entrepreneurs and creators if I'm not trusting them to you know continue operating and building to the future? I think that is a fundamental difference. I, I can't comment on Singa. I'm sure they are amazing, but. Just yes, general talking about Embracer. Okay. So maybe we can talk about the future. And I think that, you know, I, I guess kind of a cynical view, and one, one that I've, I've actually uh, been putting out there as well is that because of all of the, you know, the, the number of acquisitions over the past few years by various industry groups and, and companies, that it seems to me, my view is that the mid-tier for a lot of like mid-tier scale game studios have already been acquired. So Lars, when you look in terms of the future of Embracer, what does the future look like for you? Is it continued acquisitions? Do you think there are still a lot of attractive companies to acquire? And maybe you could just talk about the longer term uh, future plans or short, or short term or longer term future plans of Embracer. No, I think it's very easy. You know, we will continue. Uh, we will continue the same strategy we had the past years. Uh, you know, we will continue adding fantastic companies. Right. We are just, you know, 0.5 percent or one percent of the industry, and I think there is plenty of room with other amazing companies out there that that I, you know, would make sense to join the group. Uh, I think. I think it makes sense even more now to join Embracer than it perhaps were like five years ago, because now we have, you know, even more resources available in terms of capital, uh, but also the ecosystem is much wider. So I think our offering for you know people merging with us is is greater than ever and. You know, I don't see a change in that strategy over the coming 20 years. Okay. And Kenshi, for you, what does the future look like for a thinking ape? Um, well, the beautiful thing is that uh, our incentives with Embracer align really well with our long-term strategic planning internally. And, um, and for us, that's, uh, I mean, Long story short, it's we just want to continue to scale the company and get a, have a much larger impact. Okay. Um, another thing to point out uh, is that I think we're really focused, you know, not on acquisitions ourselves, but we're really focused on creating really great organic growth. And I think something that's unique about Embracer, um, well, something that is one of Embracer's strengths is, you know, even though they do uh, bring new companies into the fold, uh, they also have really strong organic growth. Uh, and, and it's something that we uh, continually reinvest in. And, you know, I think that's something that's also really exciting. Okay. Can go future plans for DECA? Oh, for DECA, you know, we are, we are building this kind of mini embracer within Embracer. So we were the first mobile and free-to-play focused company that Embracer acquired. And, you know, I was lucky enough to have Kenshi join, join me and to, to build up this strategy to help, help grow the free-to-play side of Embracer to be as big or hopefully bigger than the premium side that already existed. 
Um, it's going to be harder now with with uh, Randy joining the picture. We have, so we have a lot of big hill to overcome. But I mean, that's our that's our ambition. We want to build up something bigger. We want to build an ecosystem on the free to play side of things that's going to um, allow each of these group companies that are going to join us to be stronger than they were independent. Right. And is that loosely how Embracer is structured? Is it kind of free to play and then like premium HD or is it? I mean, we're structured into these operative groups. Right. And so these eight different groups have their own yeah. unique strategies. Okay. Uh, you know, DECA has always been focused on M&A. So we've been, we were originally acquiring just games. And then with Kenshi and Yugo, we added studios to our strategy. And so that's something relatively new. It was basically a month after we joined, we started acquiring studios. So that was a, a big transition for us. And that was something that I wanted, though. That was something, that was the reason why I joined Embracer in the first place, was to be able to do more than I was able to do on my own. Like, like, like Randy was mentioning, you know, like those are things that I would have been too shy or too scared to take on that risk by myself. Um, but now as part of the group, we've got all of these resources. And I've been able to bring on like great minds like Kenshi and Hongyi from Ayugo. And now we get to you know challenge each other with, with people like Randy. And so that's 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 gonna be the future for DECA is finding other like-minded studios that other, you know, either publishers or just pure developers, um, both on mobile and on PC that want to be part of this ecosystem in order to share knowledge and build up something together. Okay. And Randy, future Gearbox? Oh man, we got a lot of plans. We got a lot of work to do. <laughs> you know, the, our mission is to entertain the world. And, you know, we, we, we've had some success in video games and we've had some success with titles like, you know, it's pretty awesome to sell 60 million units of Borderlands games. Uh, yeah. But when you compare that against the, the population of the planet, we're a dismal failure. We have so much work to do. Uh, and, and, and the way we get there is through, you know, look, we've got some incredible IP. We need to maximize that. And some of that is, in, is through adjacent moves uh, into new platforms, new territories, new uh, business models. You know, some people really want to play games uh, that, that, that don't have a lot of friction up front. So they want free to play as their access point. Other people don't trust games unless they're premium, you know? So, so I, we have to make different products for these different kinds of customers if you to entertain them so so business models are going to be a part of it uh and demographic we we we, we should be creating new ip that reach different types of people uh, for different types of reasons and contexts and then uh you know you think about platform yeah that, that that's great in the game space but that could also extend to the medium itself you know I'm, I'm about to go to hungary to work on this movie that we're working on with borderlands and uh, i've been neck deep in this process for a while and we're learning a lot about transmedia and to be able to work with you know lionsgate and arad productions and you know eli roth is the director and kate blanchett and uh, uh kevin hart and jamie lee curtis and there's other people coming like this is an incredible experience that will lead to more and more expertise and capability with transmedia and there's so many vehicles and ways that we can entertain people and I think we're just getting started. I think we're just getting started. Awesome. Okay, guys. Well, I want to really thank you for your time. I guess in closing, is there any final message you would have for our audience? Are there any, Lars, do you have any specific kinds of companies you're looking for that you'd like to have reach out to you at all? No, I, I just want to highlight, uh, you know, to allow people to have the creative freedom and to allow people to, you know, make their own decisions and to give them time. You know, I'm always talking about that when having this public reporting that, you know, we need to let people take their time to make great games. And I think without specifically mentioning any titles, I think you have been able to see that uh, coming out from the Embrace group the past period. So I think that is super important. And, uh, and that's why we, we, you know, we're building this and we're being very diverse and, and uh, you know, I can't wait for you know, what the future will bring. Awesome. All right, well, thank you very much for your time, everybody. Kenshi, Kengo, Lars and Randy. I definitely appreciate your time. And um, until next time, thanks everybody. Thank you, cheers. Thanks, Joe.